Stories have power. They weave people, places, and ideas together. When at their best, a story can broaden an audience's perspective on the world and reveal the complexities that underlie society and our political responses to perceived threats. My name is Caitlin Wright, and I'm a Senior Immigration Services Officer at United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. Today, I'm going to tell you a story, or better yet, a story within a story. This tale begins in what would become the world's second warmest year on record, 2019. That summer, an unprecedented heat wave hit Europe. Temperatures peaked to new heights in the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. Some of you might remember the bushfires that raged throughout Australia, earning the eerie title of Black Summer. In India, the country faced the opposite problem, with devastating flooding as a result of the strongest monsoon season in the last 25 years. In the Northern Hemisphere, a different type of disaster was brewing. On the United States-Mexico border, a humanitarian and security crisis of new proportions was underway. Large groups of people, many hailing from the Northern Triangle, were making the treacherous journey through Central America and Mexico to claim asylum at the United States Southern border. The Department of Homeland Security quickly became overwhelmed to meet the diverse needs of this group. Border protection facilities built to primarily house adult male detainees lacked proper housing and supplies to care for the women, children, and elderly arriving in familial units daily. Immigration's Customs Enforcement and Health and Human Services capabilities were equally ill-equipped, resulting in overcrowding and prolonged detention of both adults and children by CBP. While the Department of Homeland Security deemed the mass number of asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border an acute and worsening crisis, I saw a foreshadowing of future events to come. In the coming decades, I imagined a new type of mass migration, driven by disappearing islands, droughts that lasted for years, increasingly severe weather, and dwindling natural resources a U.S. border inundated by mass caravans of climate migrants by both land and sea. As I started to research this hypothetical future, I learned that by the year 2050, 25 million to 1 billion people might be displaced by the effects of climate change. Yes, you heard that right. 25 million to 1 billion people. And while many will stay within the confines of their own countries, something we call internal displacement in the migration studies, some will choose to cross borders. But if they do, many, they won't meet the definition of a refugee and thus not qualify for asylum within the United States. Despite this fact, many may still try to come. Which left me with the question, would the United States be ready to handle such a future? Based on my research, an international agreement to address climate change-induced migration seemed unlikely, especially considering that on November 4th, 2019, President Donald Trump formally notified the United Nations of his intentions for the United States to leave the Paris Agreement, the international treaty to curtail further global warming and the damaging effects of climate change. Emboldened by these compelling facts, I formed my thesis question. How might the United States prepare to handle cross-border climate change-induced migration? The future, it holds innumerable uncertainties. It is impossible to know exactly how many people might be displaced by climate change and subsequently come to the United States to seek refuge. It's equally unclear how the United States government would respond to such events. Recognizing the futility of trying to predict either of these unknowns, I realized that I instead should turn to storytelling by utilizing scenario planning as my research methodology. 
Developed by the Royal Dutch Shell Company, scenario planning has been successfully used by businesses to navigate the critical uncertainties that the future holds. The technique holds equal power when it comes to public policy. Yes, even within public policy, scenario planning holds power. By contemplating a variety of scenarios from the highly plausible to unplausible, U.S. policymakers can use the methodology to robustly assess the coming years and decades, and subsequently strategically plan. With this in mind, I created a five-step process to guide my research, develop my scenarios, and assess their implications. To begin the scenario planning process, I identified driving forces that would likely play a role in shaping the future. I did this by analyzing global megatrends in business, government, and the global market. I further partition these trends by using steep analysis, categorizing each driving force as either a social, technological, economic, environmental, or political factor. Now, I recognized early on that these future megatrends, they weren't going to occur in a vacuum. So I assessed how they might intersect, leading me to determine the critical uncertainties I wanted to explore in my scenario. After determining my critical uncertainties, I categorized the key variables that would likely influence climate change-induced migration. First, clearly, is the ultimate degree of global warming over the next 30 years. The greater the temperature increases, the more people would likely be displaced. Second, is the type of disaster and its effect on the permanency of migration. Sudden disasters like hurricanes, flooding, well, they often result in temporary displacement, where slow onset disasters, think desertification, rising sea levels, ocean acidification, these lead to more cyclical migration that can gradually result in permanent resettlement. After accumulating data through the first three steps, I developed two distinct stories. Like any good story, though, I had to first determine the setting of my scenarios. I chose the year 2050 an off-sited date to project the future effects of global warming. Imagining the world 30 years from now allowed me to explore a long-term outlook while also incorporating current climate change and global projections from both the hard sciences and social sciences. So what did I end up with? Well, two scenarios, obviously. My first scenario, well, it offered a macro perspective of the world in the year 2050. And its plot revolved around how emerging economies, negative emissions technology, let's say geoengineering, for example, and resource stress, we're talking about water, food, energy, might affect geopolitics and human migration. In the second story, I explored a future from a distinctly U.S. perspective, a story in which United States borders, climate migration, and the country's economic resilience intertwined into a different, but yet still plausible, version of the year 2050. So what did I discover by assessing each scenario? To my surprise, I found that a strong U.S. preparedness plan, well, it doesn't need to simply revolve around deterrence. Instead of looking at climate-induced migration as a threat that only securitization can solve, I found that migration well, it's a reasonable form of adaptation for those displaced by a warming world. When I reframed climate migration in such a way, I found opportunities that became apparent. Those displaced could help the United States by ensuring our future economic resilience, filling critical jobs shortages, helping us pursue regional cooperation, and maintaining our international competitiveness. So let's break this down. First, the homeland security of the United States, it not only relies on secure borders, but also on economic stability and resiliency. By the year 2050, it is estimated that one out of four Americans will be 65 years or older. Yeah, you heard me right. I said 25% of the population by the year 2050 will be most likely 65 or older. So we know then that the demand for healthcare and social services will exponentially rise while the number of working age adults will shrink. 
Climate migrants could therefore fill critical job shortages while also contributing to the U.S. tax base, which will obviously be necessary to help cope with the high costs of an elderly population and the costly effects of climate change. When it comes to international agreements, right now, they remain elusive when it comes to climate change-induced migration. However, regional agreements between the United States and its neighboring countries are feasible and they could be pursued today. Through regional cooperation, the United States could offer populations from countries most vulnerable to a warming world the ability to work in America. Having a job means a person would have an income to not only support themselves, but also to send home to their families who remain behind. Remittances sent home not only help bolster the resiliency of the family, but also the greater community where the money is spent. By increasing resiliency of other countries' populations, we could decrease the likelihood of those most vulnerable ever becoming victim to the effects of climate change. And finally, the future international power of the United States, it's not a given. In the coming decades, the world will likely witness an economic power shift from the West in favor of the East. Yes, we're talking about China. Thus, the United States will have to compete with other nations to attract and retain talent. Maintaining our competitiveness in such a global economy will require a strong, talented workforce that migrants could fill. Through these findings, my thesis ultimately concluded with the following recommendations. In terms of regional cooperation, the United States should pursue more free movement agreements with the Caribbean islands and even assess expanding the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement to include other countries from Central and South America. When it comes to future economic resiliency and international competitiveness, Congress should amend current immigration law and increase the annual statutory limit on H-1B and H-2B worker visas, and subsequently expand the TN visa category to non-professionals. Congress should also consider creating a Caribbean-specific temporary visa program focused on critical job shortages. And I can look to Australia as an example. Finally, although many opportunities do exist, the multitude of threats climate change poses to the United States, they do remain exceedingly great, up to and including the unregulated use of geoengineering. Therefore, DHS should incorporate climate change into all six Homeland Security missions and update the DHS strategic plan accordingly. Along those same lines, DHS and its immigration sub-branches should also assess the impacts climate change will have on mass migrations from the Caribbean, Central America, and South America. Although my thesis did not focus specifically on the topic of deterrence, further research could and should be pursued. The stories I created in my thesis illuminated the wide gamuts of threats, opportunities, and even surprises the future holds when it comes to climate change-induced migration. When it comes to strategic preparedness, policymakers often rely on the past as an indicator of how the future will unfold. Obviously, this is a very narrow and rigid version of the coming years and decades. From first class, the COVID-19 pandemic, the 2008 financial crisis, and many more events that have rocked the United States in the past decades may have seemed like complete surprises. But if we peel back those layers, it becomes clear that key indicators and trends were there. Yet policymakers were blinded by this status quo, assuming such events were unplausible, or even worse, not even considering them in the first place. Leading to the ultimate question, within the Homeland Security enterprise, what other trends and key indicators might we be missing? Although the story of my thesis concluded just over a year ago, its longevity continues. On October 7, 2021, the Department of Homeland Security released a new climate action plan. Weeks later, the agency also released the DHS Strategic Framework for Addressing Climate Change in response to President Biden's Executive Order 14008. 
The new report recognizes climate change and its impacts as an acute and systemic threat to the safety, security, and the prosperity of the United States. In its efforts to address climate change, the agency is committed to incorporating strategic foresight, yeah, that's right, into all levels of its planning and decision-making process, including scenario-based planning, which will enable DHS to translate global drivers and trends to relevant impacts on the department's missions. Finally, and perhaps the most encouraging, the White House recently released a report on the impact of climate change on migration. Do I think my thesis prompted these re recent changes? <laughs> no. <laughs> However, I do think it's rhetoric and recommendations fed into a greater movement we are now seeing throughout the United States. A re-emphasis on taking the effects of climate change seriously and finding real solutions to help ensure the future security of our nation. Therefore, I leave you with these closing thoughts. What stories can you tell within your own organizations to create awareness and readiness about the future? How can storytelling, using scenario and planning, empower your own agency for the critical uncertainties the coming years and decades might hold? Thank you.